Bringing in our panel now, Britt Hume, your top line analysis, sir. Well, I think the thing to worry about from that nuclear plant is something that Trey touched on, and that is not so much that they're going to blow the place up or, or anything like that. I don't think the Russians will do that, but they're in a position now to turn the lights out on a big section of, of Ukraine, which would be which would be devastating and people would be without heat and they'd be without electricity they'd be without things that they need to live so that is why this is a, this the capture of that nuclear power plant is such a big deal in my view and jillian despite reports of resistance and stalling putin maintains that everything is going according to schedule to his plan <clears throat> and the execution of such your thoughts um everything is not going according to putin's plan among a whole host of miscalculations and mistakes and blunders he has presided over during the first week of this war. The biggest mistake he's made is underestimating the will of the Ukrainian people to take to the streets, to take up arms and defend their homeland. Um, so, you know, it's unsurprising that he is saying that. Um, he would. I mean, he's an autocrat isolated uh, in his compound inside Moscow. Um, it's not to say, though, Emily, that there isn't much to be fearful. There is a tremendous amount to be fearful of right now. Um, Ukrainian journalists are fleeing in the middle of the night in fear of their lives. We heard yesterday I broke reporting um, from a European official who told me that they have seen intelligence documents that show Russia's uh, security service, intelligence services, the FSS, have draft plans to conduct public education. Uh, executions in Ukrainian cities as they take them over one by one. Um, so even though Putin is failing so far, there is still a very treacherous road ahead for the Ukrainians. As well, the Russians, Brit, so just yesterday a bill was introduced and voted on in the floor there in Russia, sentencing, quote, unofficial reporting or an unofficial reporter to 15 years in prison. So talk to us about the larger scale operations by Putin, uh, both in Ukraine and then as well at home. Well, one of the issues we have to deal with here is while the world is watching this and much of the world is seeing this, this, this war being fought basically in real time with all the hideous images that are coming out, as you can see on the screen now, a wonderful example of that, um, in Russia it's a different matter entirely. And this effort to crack down on what few independent sources of news there are in Russia uh, will make it even more difficult for the people of Russia to, to know what's really going on. Uh, I saw a report today from a person who was in, in, in Ukraine being shelled, speaking to her mother in Russia, who said she didn't believe it. Mm. So it gives you that this, it is always true, as Abraham Lincoln said, you can fool some of the people all the time. And in Russia, the effort is underway, of course, to fool all the people all the time. Uh, which would be an impediment to any hope we might have that the Russian people would rise up. I think that remain, that's been a long shot and remains a very long shot indeed. That's right. And yesterday, President Zelensky, uh, in his continued appeal for global support, maintained that the might of, of all the globe is bigger than Putin's might. And he sort of kept emphasizing, I need more help, sort of begging, frankly, for support. Your thoughts on the reaction of the surrounding countries? We know that NATO has rejected a no-fly zone. Um, so what do you see happening? What do you see occurring in the realm of support? And will that be enough? Is there an inevitability to this uh, one way or another, Britt? Well, the Western nations and NATO uh, countries will continue to push supplies and, and uh, weaponry into Ukraine. Um, they could certainly use uh, air support, but that's been ruled out, and I think probably sensibly so. One thing that, that General Keane has mentioned, which I think is, is potentially very important, is the possibility of U.S. covert operations. Uh, we've been doing these kinds of operations and training for them for many years now, and many experts think we've gotten quite good at it, and it, it can be done with deniability uh, such that we could take, and obviously there's risk. Uh, but that could make a difference, in, particularly in certain parts of Ukraine. So, and, and we won't know about that until later, if ever. And that's probably, the, that's probably a good thing. That is but a good so, thing. It's, it's something to be aware of. That's right, Dagan, because there's certainly <clears throat> no shortage of support conceptually, certainly by the American people and, frankly, the majority of the globe. Uh, the question is how. Uh, to add to what Britt was saying, the Wall Street Journal editorial page wrote uh, a piece on what the U.S. can do. And in terms of covert capabilities, we can unleash those with a presidential finding. And our covert operations could help special forces with, say, they 
they have expertise in sabotage. They can use unmanned drones. These vehicle convoys, the Russian vehicle convoys, are kind of, to use the journal's words, ripe for the use of uh, unmanned drones. But Vladimir Putin's not going to stop. Like we're talking about one quarter of the elect, you know, the energy being cut off with the, the attack on this one nuclear facility. The goal is to, to wipe out the entire country. And Brit could weigh in on this, but Brit, so many people have gone back to what happened in Grozny in 99-2000 under the leadership of then burgeoning tyrant Vladimir Putin, where that city was reduced to rubble. The UN yeah. referred to it as the most destroyed city on earth. There were no rules of warfare. There was rape. There was torture of civilians. And that's the one of the gravest concerns uh, by the, the rest of the world. And maybe the focus of cameras within Ukraine will prevent that from happening. But I was curious, because you are a uh, historian, um, an amazing one. <laughs> well, I wouldn't go that far. Yes, I'm just you a are, reporter, but, <laughs> but thank you. Uh, well, I think you know, Grozny was an example of what Putin is willing to do. Aleppo in Syria is the same thing. Um, you know, he, I think he would have liked to carry this out in sort of a, of a, a, a quick strike, decisive uh, three-day campaign, get control of Kiev, depose the leader, maybe even kill him, uh, install some quizzling to, to run the place for him. Uh, that has failed, obviously, and continues to fail. At least the attack from the north does. So we're in now. Now we're settled in for what looks like it's going to be a much more protracted, bloody, and brutal conflict. And you can't rule out that, that he, he would employ exactly the same tactics he did in Grozny and Aleppo, uh, reduce those places to, to, as you say, rubble and to ashes. Um, the fact, though, that this is going to be visible to much of the rest of the world in the way that those other two places were not may, as you've suggested, be a deterring factor. That's right, Kaylee. So against the backdrop of a pattern by Putin of, frankly, war crimes, we have another example of the audacity for him to attack a, a power plant, which, frankly, held the word the world captive in fear for the last 12 hours. Yeah, I do uh, worry about the unprecedented nature of this. And, Britt, maybe you can speak to that. Um, when you consider and look back at nuclear power plants in times of war, what you see is there have been plants under construction that have been destroyed. Iraq is an example, Syria, Israel. Um, but when you look at nuclear plants that are actually operational. The two examples that we have are Armenia, Azerbaijan, that conflict, also India, Pakistan. But the fighting took place hundreds of miles from these operational plants. And according to The Economist, to have an operational nuclear plant seized by force is unprecedented. So does the unprecedented nature of this, I agree with you entirely, Vladimir Putin doesn't want to blow this up. He just wants to maintain control. But does the uh, unprecedented nature concern you? Well, of course it does. Um, in, much, in many ways, this, this war is, uh, is unprecedented, at least in, in recent uh, times. And one can, you know, the more frustrated he becomes, Putin, um, the, more, the more dangerous he becomes, it seems to me. Is, at least that's something we have to worry about. So here we are now. This is, what, day eight of a campaign that I think it was hoped by the Russian authorities would last only a few days. And here we are at day eight. Kiev is still in, in Ukrainian hands. Uh, a, a couple of places have fallen. More, more almost certainly will. Uh, but we can't. What we can't tell is how far this will go. Uh, and you know, I, I, my sense of this is this could go on for a very long time. And even if he gets contr apparent control of the place, there'll be an insurgency. That will be bloody. And that Ukraine is going to be in a terrible place for a very long time. And that convoy is still stalled, blessedly. Mm -hmm. That's right. And it seems like we keep hearing, you know, the next 36 hours will be crucial. But we keep hearing that. So how many more uh, chunks of 36 hours until, to your point, what is inevitable? Hi, everyone. I'm Brian Kilmeade. I want you to do me a favor. I want you to click to subscribe to the Fox News YouTube page. This is the only way that I know for sure that you're not going to miss any great commentary, any great news bites, any great interviews coming your way on Fox. You can get it all here on YouTube. So subscribe right now.